Then moving on to creditor management, credit given by a company suppliers is a type of financing that arises naturally from normal operations. And guys, the logic behind creditor management is you want the creditor's payment period to be as long as possible because then you can use this financing that you get from your suppliers to finance inventory and to finance debtors. Now, the management of creditors involves the following. First, you need to negotiate favorable credit terms with creditors. So you want the creditor's payment period to be as long as possible. You then need to create and maintain good relationships with your creditors. And you should also be able to evaluate the cost of creditor finance. And that's what we are looking at just below. Guys, the formula over here in your notes is the formula that you use to calculate the cost of not taking a discount. So if a creditor offers you a discount for early settlement, so they might say if you pay your account within 30 days, you can get a 5% discount. The cost of not taking that discount is calculated by using this formula. So I'm going to go to the lecture example and I'm going to quickly go through this calculation with you. Please jump to lecture example 4.1. In this example, you are told that Peggy Limited's credit terms are 2 slash 30 net 60. So guys, that means if the account is settled within 30 days, you qualify for a 2% discount, but the account must be settled within 60 days. You are also told that the company's bank overdraft rate is 14%. Now you need to determine whether you should pay the creditor early, should you pay within 30 days so that you can get this 2% discount, or should you rather wait and only pay in 60 days. That's what we are looking at in this example. So using the formula that I gave you in your lecture notes, remember this is the formula that we use to calculate the cost of not taking the discount. So this is the cost of not taking the discount. Let's input everything into this calculation. First you take the discount, which is 2%. You then divide by 100 minus the discount. So 100 minus 2%. You then multiply by 365 and you divide by N. And we calculate N by taking the reduction in payment period to qualify for the discount. So any accounts with Peggy need to be settled within 60 days. However, if you want to qualify for the discount, you need to pay in 30 days. So the reduction in payment period to qualify for the discount is 60 minus 30. And the cost of not taking the discount is 24.8%. So that's what it costs the company if they don't take the discount and they pay in 60 days. We need to compare that to the cost of taking the discount. So guys, if the company wants to qualify for this 2% discount, they need to settle their account in 30 days. So they are probably going to have to make use of their overdraft facility in order to pay this account earlier so that they can qualify for the discount. So the overdraft rate in this example is 14%. So the cost of taking the discount, if they pay in 30 days, they will then qualify for the discount, but they are going to have to use their bank overdraft to make the payment. So if they pay in 30 days, it's going to cost them 14% to take the discount. If they pay in 60 days, meaning they won't qualify for the discount, the cost of not taking the discount is 24.8%. Jump back to your lecture notes. You are going to compare the cost of not taking the discount to the cost of taking the discount. So to the organization's regular cost of short-term financing, or in other words, the overdraft rate. Compare the two. If the overdraft rate is lower, then the discount should be taken. If the overdraft rate is higher, then the discount should not be taken. 
go back to the lecture example. In this case over here, you can see the cost of not taking the discount is higher than the cost of taking the discount. So, the cost of taking the discount is cheaper. It is cheaper for them to pay in 30 days and take the discount because that costs them 14%. If they don't take the discount, it costs them 24.8%. So they should borrow the money at a cost of 14% so that they can pay the supplier within 30 days and take advantage of the discount. Then when it comes to inventory management, the purpose of inventory management is to maintain sufficient inventory levels to avoid running out of inventory, but you also need to keep these levels as low as possible so that you reduce holding costs. Obviously there's a cost associated to holding inventory, so you can't just hold excessive inventory. Now guys, when it comes to inventory management, it's very important that you always consider the nature of the business and also the environment in which that business operates, because inventory management differs significantly from industry to industry. So for example, a grocery store that sells perishables will have a much higher inventory turnover. Because they're selling perishables, they need to sell their stock a lot faster than, for example, a furniture store. So this will change significantly from industry to industry. You can't say that an inventory holding period of 30 days is fine for any type of business. It obviously depends on the type of business you are dealing with. Then when it comes to good inventory management, you need to be able to calculate the optimal reorder point, and you also need to be able to calculate the optimal reorder quantity. Now guys, the optimal reorder point tells us the number of units in inventory when the next order is placed. So let's say, for example, you perform this calculation and you get an answer of 200 units. That means when the stock levels in your storeroom reach 200 units, you then need to place your next order. So the optimal reorder point tells us when the next order should be placed. On the other hand, the optimal reorder quantity helps us decide on the optimum order size for inventory, which will minimize the cost of ordering and also stockholding costs. So the optimal reorder point tells us when the next order should be placed, and the optimal reorder quantity tells us the optimal order size, or in other words, how much inventory should be ordered. Now guys, please refer to the lecture examples and make sure you are able to calculate the optimal reorder point and also the optimal reorder quantity. They are very simple calculations. Then we just need to discuss just-in-time in a bit more detail. Now the whole purpose of a just-in-time process is to reduce inventories to as low a level as possible. And the reason for trying to reduce inventory levels is so that you can reduce holding costs and improve profitability. So how a just-in-time process works is raw materials are received just in time from suppliers to go into the production process. So the company doesn't hold high levels of raw material. And in addition to that, manufactured goods are completed just in time to be sold to customers. So the company isn't holding excessive volumes of finished goods. As production is complete, the inventory is sold. So the whole purpose of this is to try and reduce inventories to as low a level as possible. Now guys, obviously there's going to be a risk of stock shortages, but this can be avoided if the process is set up correctly. So how should a company correctly set up their just-in-time process to avoid a situation of running out of inventory? Well, first they need to have a strong relationship with their suppliers. 
They need to enter into long-term contracts with their suppliers, and those suppliers must be located close to the manufacturing facility. Obviously, that will facilitate delivery. If they are situated close to the manufacturing facility, delivery is a lot easier. Also, the suppliers need to be reliable in terms of the quality of material. They can't supply inferior quality material that needs to be returned, and then the company needs to wait for them to issue better quality material because those delays will obviously result in stock shortages. So they need to be reliable in terms of quality and also in terms of timely delivery. If there are any delivery delays, that is going to result in stock shortages. Then, in addition to that, products must be manufactured with zero defect and no product is reworked. So once again, guys, the company needs to make sure that maintenance is carried out on all of their machines so that they don't have any machine breakdowns because as soon as you have a breakdown in the production process, obviously you're then going to have a stock shortage and you won't be able to supply the product to your customers, so there's a risk of losing customers. So machines must be regularly maintained so that you avoid breakdowns and idle workers should carry out preventative maintenance to also avoid breakdowns. And no product can be reworked, guys. We can't come to the end of the manufacturing process and realize we have an inferior quality product and we have to reject that. By the end of that process, the product that is completed needs to be sold to a customer, otherwise you are going to lose that customer to the competition. So you need to make sure that quality is built into the production process. So products are produced with zero defect and no products are reworked. There's no products that are of inferior quality that need to be corrected before they can actually be sold to customers. And then in addition to that, or lastly, one unit is produced at a time so that the company can easily react to changes in product specifications and demand. So we won't have bulk production, because if you have bulk production, then you can't easily react to changes because those units have already been made. Instead, the ideal batch size when we are dealing with a just-in-time process is one unit. All right, please go and have a look at the lecture examples when it comes to inventory management. Then lastly, we need to look at cash management. And the purpose of cash management is to ensure that the company has sufficient cash available so that they can meet essential cash commitments. You don't want a situation where you don't have enough cash available to pay salaries and wages, for example. And this is to avoid borrowing cash at higher interest rates. Because if you don't have enough cash available, you're probably going to have to borrow funds or you're going to have to use your bank overdraft, and that is going to result in increased finance costs. However, you can't hold too much cash because we know that by holding too much cash, that will have a negative impact on profitability because of the low return earned. Interest earned on positive cash balances is very low, so you don't want to sit on excessive cash. If the company has excessive cash, they should rather invest that somewhere else where they can earn a, a higher or a better return. then please make sure you are able to discuss the various methods that can be used to relieve cash flow problems. So if we have a company that's experiencing cash flow problems, what can they do to solve that problem? Now you guys will see a lot of the discussion over here is around working capital management. And it's around reducing your debtors days, because remember we want to collect money from debtors as fast as possible. Reduce your inventory days, because you want to sell inventory as fast as possible, and increase creditor days so that you can use creditor finance in order to finance your debtors and inventory. So delay the payment of creditors without ruining relationships with them. So let's look at the discussion over here. So first you need to make sure that debtors are invoiced promptly. If you don't invoice the debtor, they obviously can't pay you. You then need to try and offer settlement discounts to debtors in the hopes that they will pay sooner. Then any long outstanding debtors should be handed over to external collectors. You can also consider factoring debtors, but that is very expensive. So that all deals with decreasing debtors. Then 
If we look at decreasing inventory, you should reduce inventory levels or decrease the inventory turnover by increasing sales and decreasing your inventory holding costs. If we look at increasing creditors, you should try and delay creditor payments without damaging relationships with suppliers. And then linked to that, creditors is one form of short-term finance. Another form of short-term finance is the company's bank overdraft. So they can try and increase their bank overdraft. So that deals with all of the working capital management things that can be done in order to relieve cash flow problems. There are a few other things that companies can also consider. They can sell assets that are not earning sufficient returns. They can enter into sale and lease back transactions. So sell the asset, get the money from that sale so that you have the money in the business and then lease the asset back so that you can still use it. Obviously, if they are experiencing cash flow problems, they should not be paying dividends. They should not replace assets, so they should try and delay routine replacement of assets. They should look at expanding their product range or changing their existing product mix. They should look at cost-cutting initiatives. And if possible, they should try and negotiate with SARS to pay off taxes over a specified period. So all of those things, guys, will help a company relieve cash flow problems. Then please make sure you also look at the other lecture examples when it comes to cash management. All right, guys, that then brings us to the end of this lecture. If there's anything that you're struggling with, please let me know.